What's up everybody, it's Charles. Today we're going to be disassembling the bottom end of this TSI engine. You guys may remember that we did a top end disassembly, remove the cylinder head, strip down all the timing chains, balance shaft chains, of course oil pump drive chain, and found out that we had a bunch of bent valves. Well, I've been getting a lot of questions lately about oil pressure issues and bottom end TSI questions. So I thought, hey, we got this engine apart. Let's go ahead and keep tearing it down and take the bottom end apart, the crankshaft out, the pistons out, and the balance shafts out, and see what kind of issues we might have down at the bottom. If you didn't already watch that video of the top end disassembly, recommend checking that out. I'll, of course, link it up in the cards and throw a link down in the description. Let's go ahead and start on the bottom side by removing the lower oil pan. We'll use our flexible scraper to break the sealant for the pan. Once our pan is loose, we'll go ahead and pull it up. Boy, you can actually see a bunch of sludge down in the bottom of that pan. I'm not sure if that's just carbon from the oil breaking down or if that's actually metal. So we can grab a magnet. It doesn't look to be metallic or at least ferrous metal anyway. So let's keep moving and see what else we find. This plastic piece here is our baffling for our oil. Here we have our oil pickup. This is another common place for failure where it'll get junk built up in it and actually reduce the amount of oil that can be sucked up through it. What I like to normally do is take the oil pickup tube, shine my light down in it, and look for any debris, anything from metal to plastic broken to bits of silicone that got left behind from another job. This one looks pretty good. When we shine our light through it, you can actually see a little bit of blockage, but nothing major. Next, we'll go ahead and take our oil pump off. Now, I did notice this little triangular screen piece was actually just kind of sitting here on the upper oil pan. Let's see if we can find where that goes. Guessing thereabouts there's probably where this came from. I went ahead and moved our engine from the stand it was on to this work table. That way we can access what's on the back a little bit easier. Let's go ahead and get this upper oil pan off. In addition to getting all of these bolts from this side, we actually need to remove the bolts from the rear main seal, which means if you have to remove this upper oil pan, you need to take the transmission out and get the rear main seal off. Go ahead and take our seal off. I'm going to assume that this was replaced at some point. It is the older style though. The newer style actually has two lips on the seal. Next, we'll go ahead and separate our upper oil pan from our engine block. Now we have access to our crankshaft and our connecting rod bolts. If you're going to be putting these back on, it's a good idea to mark them, cylinder one, two, three, four, and make sure when you stage them out that you're staging them out in the right order. And you can even put a little arrow facing the front of the engine if you want, it's totally up to you. Our bearings actually look super good. No damage, a little tiny score mark right there, but I wouldn't hesitate to put that back in. Cylinder four is facing out too, so let's go ahead and remove that one. Another one where the bearing looks pretty good. Rotate our engine around, and we'll do cylinder two and cylinder three. There's two, another one looks good. So that's good to see that all the bearings look pretty good for the connecting rods. Go ahead and take this guide for the balance shaft off. And actually go ahead and remove our crankshaft gear too. All right, next we're gonna remove our main cap bolts. Now there's these main cap bolts that you're looking at right here. There's also main cap bolts that come in from the side for these three caps. All right, we got one set of our main cap bolts out. Let's go ahead and take the ones on the lower part of the sides of the block. We'll actually have to take this little bracket off too. There's gonna be three of these on each side. One, two, and that was the third one. And we'll actually need an extension for this one because we're gonna go through the bracket for the oil filter. A shorty extension will do just fine. We'll get our magnet and grab the last one. All right, let's go ahead and take our main caps off. 
These look a little less happy than our connecting rod bearings, but all in all, not too bad. We got all of our main caps off. Let's go ahead and carefully lift the crankshaft out. I'm actually gonna thread this bolt in a little bit. That'll help, uh, help manage it a little bit easier. All right, there we go, crankshaft is out. You can actually see the piston squirters that'll squirt oil up into the bottom of the piston that this engine has, which is pretty cool. Now we're gonna flip it over, take the pistons out with the connecting rods, and then we'll go ahead and do the balance shafts. You know, this is actually one of the more common places for oil consumption to be an issue. On the cars that had the longitudinal two liter, they actually used oval shaped pistons. They also tried to use piston rings that didn't push against the cylinder walls quite so hard. And that's one of the main reasons for oil consumption on this engine. The fix was actually putting pistons from the transverse mount engines into the longitudinal engines which is why Audi had so many more problems than Volkswagen had. We barely rerung any of these engines where Audi was doing it all the time. Cylinder two. If you were taking all these out in a rebuild, you definitely want to label everything. Make sure it goes back where it came from. You can see just how much crusty carbon is on there, but it actually cleans off pretty easy, so. That's cool, right? And cylinder four. We must have spilt some coolant on this one. You can see a little bit of coolant there. We got the pistons out. Next, let's see what the cylinder walls look like. So it looks like the cylinders are actually in pretty good shape. If we were to rebuild this engine, we probably wouldn't really need to even hone the cylinders. Of course, if we we're doing a full rebuild, we would take all our proper measurements inside the cylinder bore. Next up, we are going to work on our balance shaft. As you can see, we got the chain off already. We'll go ahead and just take that tensioner out of the way. We'll take all our, the rest of our guides off and then remove the balance shaft at the exhaust side and at the intake side. Sometimes you can actually remove these balance shafts by hand. There is a special tool to remove this. It's a cup that sort of fits around the backside, and then you can use a slide hammer to extract the balance shaft. We're gonna see if we can nurse this one out with a pry bar before having to break the big guns out. There we go. So here is our exhaust side balance shaft, and what happens is this little screen right here gets clogged up and oil can't pass through, and that actually can cause the balance shaft to seize. This one looks pretty decent. You wanna check the bearing at the backside as well. There's also this plastic sleeve that I have heard of coming apart and actually causing some of the blockage on the balance shaft. This one looks to be pretty well intact. This sort of sits on in here like this. Go ahead and get the other one out and see what that one looks like. Now remember, we have one balance shaft on the exhaust side, one on the intake side. The intake side also drives the water pump, so we're gonna have to unbolt the belt that attaches to the water pump. Also, our balance shafts rotate in different directions. That's why we have this relay roller right here, so it can rotate and then rotate this intake side balance shaft the other direction. This comes off pretty easily. We got a T30 down here we need to remove. Next, we gotta take this cover off to get access to the water pump belt. Here is our belt that drives the water pump. This belt actually, you can just slip right off. You can see this water pump's leaking pretty good. There's a pretty good leak down here at the bottom. Normally when you're taking this bolt out, you would counter hold like the crankshaft or something to make sure that this all didn't move. Since we have all that stuff out, we're just gonna counter hold the water pump. I'm not too worried about it because if this engine ever goes back together, we'll be putting a new water pump on it anyway. Also remember that this bolt is reverse threaded or counter threaded. It's also really important to use a high quality tool here. I've seen guys strip this bolt out using cheap wrenches and that, uh, that is not a fun thing to have to extract. After some fighting trying to hold this and get this bolt out right here, I just went ahead and popped this freeze plug out. Now we can get an impact on it and zip it right out. This is the little bolt that causes people so many problems. These like to break too down here on the threaded part. 
Luckily, they come out pretty easily. Here's the gear and the belt that drive the water pump from the balance shaft. Now we should be able to just nurse our balance shaft out. Since we have all this apart, we can probably tap it from the back side and get the balance shaft out. All right, here we go. Here's our intake side balance shaft. Actually looks pretty good. If you look real close inside that little filter basket there, you can see some debris clogging up the balance shaft. It's not too bad. I don't think this one had like a severe issue like a lot of people are experiencing, but I think this is actually becoming a pretty common cause of oil pressure lights. Now, if you've just done an oil change and you're immediately getting an oil pressure light right after that, there's something you wanna look at. This is where our oil filter mounts, and what can happen if you take the oil filter out, the old one out, and walk away, this little plastic piece right here can actually pop out and go flying. It's spring loaded, it'll go pew, and go flying. You won't notice it because you weren't standing maybe right there when it happened, and then you'll run into oil pressure issues. So if you are getting an oil pressure light right after an oil change, pop the filter off and make sure this little piece is inside of where you install the oil filter. If it's not, you need to find it and install it. This bracket right here, you can see it's got the oil cooler mounted on it, has oil running right through it. Clearly, that's where our oil filter mounts. It's also where our oil pressure switches are. So if this little guy's not in there, that can cause you oil problems. All right, so there's our engine completely torn down. Of course, we got a couple accessories we could take off if we really wanted to. I'm surprised at how good the bottom end of this engine looked based on how the top end of the engine looked, which is actually a good sign if you do have one of these engines. The bottom end may actually be just fine. You only need top end engine repair. I say only. It's still not a very cheap thing to do. So guys, I'm going to wrap it up there. Questions, comments, drop them down below. If you liked the video, hit that thumbs up button. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll talk to you again next time.